Yep. Nice. So now I, now I get extra scared because I'm recording myself as well. Uh, but welcome everyone to first year's VCF. Uh, we hope that uh, you have a great 2021 this year. Um, and uh, let's start with our first talk. We have uh, Hauke Barch, who many of you probably know from the MMIV Center. Uh, those of you who don't know Hauke, Hauke has a PhD in computational nano, uh, neuroscience. He's working with uh, the diffusion tensor imaging and uh, brain data. Um, some of you may remember Hauke from uh, two years ago when he also did another presentation in uh, uh, this visual computing forum. Uh, then he was presenting a large cohort study in the United States where um, um, they did a great, great, great job trying to uh, trying to track how much progress they made over the years. And they actually, they actually made it possible to collect uh, enough data. But today he's gonna tell us something else. Uh, today he's gonna tell us how to make fake lungs. And before he's gonna do that, I'm uh, going to remind you, which many of you probably don't know, is that Hauke from last week or maybe a week before, is a new colleague of ours. So he got a adjunct associate professorship uh, with the University of Bergen and he's with the visualization group. So hope you like this small introduction of Hauke and please, board is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be part of the group and I'm looking forward to um, a lot of uh, visits online or in person. So I um, I wanted to talk about this um, real fake medical data for for a while because I think it's it's really cool. And when I prepared the talk, I was trying to find out so why why do I think this is cool? Because if I you know if you really write it down, it's there is not much to it. And I, I think I discovered that um, it has some connection to what I've done before. So um, if I uh, just show you this. So, so there is this law, uh, give a small boy a hammer and he will find that everything he encounters needs pounding. Um, that exists in a lot of different contexts. Uh, some people call it the Birmingham screwdriver for example, you know, a hammer. So it is kind of a talk about something that I did a long time ago and now rediscovered it, that it's actually useful for something else. And that's probably explains why I'm so excited about it. <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to tell you a little bit about the story. So about this, you know, yesterday's solution. Um, and then uh, the, the problem from today that uh, hopefully this uh, has a small part in, in, in solving and then uh, show a little bit what the toolkit is in order to do something like this. And it's really just a toolkit talk. So you know, hopefully you, you find it useful and maybe it's something that you can use on your own. So yesterday's solution was actually, um, how do we see? <laughs> and uh, that's uh, actually experiments that were done on cats, optical imaging. And uh, that's primary visual cortex and how do they see edges. The problem from today is more related to, um, to a research grant that we have at the moment, which is uh, workflow integrated machine learning. Uh, so it's uh, in the medical field and we're trying to use machine learning solutions to uh, train large uh, deep learning models. So that's the, that's the problem from today. So from cats to deep learning models. And then um, I will demonstrate a little bit uh, uh, design tools to allow you to you know, generate uh, basically data using computational geometry, very easy things. Um, I have to say, uh, so I have some nice pictures and they're all computer generated. And then I have some really crappy pictures and those are all done by myself in PowerPoint. So please excuse the... Uh, bad ones and <clears throat> hopefully enjoy the good ones. Okay, so here um, is basically a picture from uh, Colin Blakemore's paper. 
uh, which talks about uh, this cat's primary visual cortex. I was happy enough to you know, get um, um, a master's thesis uh, uh, doing this. Uh, so what you, what you actually do as an experiment is um, you're interested in human brains and uh, in the human brain, the visual cortex is uh, deeply hidden uh, insight. So it's, you know, that there is no easy way to access it. But for cats, the same kind of area is on the outside of the brain and therefore it's accessible to experiments. So what you can actually do is you can take your cat or somebody else's cat, and then you can drill a hole into the skull. And what you will see is under red lights, um, the blood vessel pattern of the dura uh, that you can see on the top left. Um, this is actually an area of the cat's brain that is responsible for vision. So it's one of the very first uh, areas. So what you do is you take a CCD camera and then you're showing the cats uh, a picture on the screen. And the picture is usually just a, a moving grating of a specific orientation. So it looks like the bars in a prison. Uh, and that grating is moving and is um, exciting a lot of neurons in the cortex. And if you change the orientation of the grating, uh, then you will see that specific areas in the, in the brain are activated by this. And that's kind of uh, you know, uh, similar to a bold signal. So you can see where a lot of blood is used and then those uh, areas darken. So it's called intrinsic imaging. And the algorithm, um, as, as always, 20% correct, is, is basically you show this pattern at zero degrees, and then you capture the brain surface. Um, and then you're showing an orthogonal pattern at 90 degrees, and then you're capturing the brain surface again. And if you do this, then you can calculate for each location in the image, each pixel, what is the preferred orientation? Is it a lot of activity in this area for zero or for 90 or a mixture of the both? Of both and uh, that, that's kind of uh, just looking at the face uh, of the complex number. And then you get an orientation, the, 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 the face back as the preferred orientation for each location in the cortex. And this is actually a, a really cool finding. Um, it's true in humans as well, it's, it's cortical maps. So one uh, point on the surface of the, of the brain is responsible for one particular orientation. And as you move through the brain, then you encounter like a smooth con continuous uh, change from one orientation to the next. And this is displayed in this orientation map in the middle of the slide here. Okay, so um, from that, um, there, uh, the, what really happens, uh, you know, this, this very simple uh, explanation of taking two images and generating this nice map is actually not true. Um, the problem is a little bit that the images are very noisy, the signal is very low, there is a lot of background. So what happens is that the images need to be normalized uh, to the signal that you get back if you just show an empty, so no grating screen. And, uh, uh, there, there's also the camera and the field of view, et cetera, because it's a, it's a, it's a real experiment. So they're spatially high pass filtered. Um, they're smooth in both actually time and they're binned um, with a moving window, usually like four by four or two by two. And then you subtract the smooth image from the original image. And then the subtraction images are actually the ones that you can then use. <laughs> so you, uh, you do a lot of pre-processing and basically what you, what you have is you have very noisy subtraction images and you do some filtering and you do filtering in both uh, time and space. So the, the, this type of you know, noisy images and bandpass filtering, um, you, can, you can see this again if you if you follow this very simple MATLAB program. It's really just the loop. I'm starting with two images um, and they're just uh, random numbers in the grid of 64 by 64. It's like a 2D and they're around zero. And uh, one of those images would look like the bottom left image. It's basically just a, a random uh, uh, group of pixels. The, the nice thing about this kind of white noise is that 
it's actually um, um, has a as a power spectrum which is flat. That means that there is structure on, on any on, on every scale in, in the picture up to the resolution of the of the pixel, of course. So what happens here in this for loop is I'm basically um, showing uh, two of those, the image one and the image two. Uh, and then I'm showing just an image where I, I'm looking at the angle between the two, you know, the, the face of this uh, uh, complex number using this um, Arcus Tangens function. This is also um, not really what really happens, but uh, it's, it's an illustration for what, what is to come. Then uh, there's this keyboard stating, uh, statement in line eight, which is basically stops the animation. And then I'm just filtering each of the images, image one and image two by a Gaussian. It's, it's just uh, you know, smoothing the image. So if I smooth the image using this loop, then uh, iteration zero, I have the original noise case. At iteration one, uh, it will be a smoothed image, uh, 64 by 64. You see some edge effects. Uh, there are no circular boundary conditions, for example, in this example. So it's, it's really a toy to just show you <laughs> that from a random field, uh, you actually can recover at iteration two some white and black dots. And you can see here that they're around zero. So there is some uh, positive and some negative uh, um, structure. Uh, from, from noise. So um, now let's go back to the original one, um, the algorithm, and let's run this uh, like five, five different iterations. And what you can see here at iteration zero, um, our loop generates these three images, the random A, the random B, uh, with different color maps in this case, uh, just to have like, um, you know, around zero, a little bit green, positive, and red, negative. And then this face image, uh, which in iteration zero, of course, is also just a random image. But because of this Arcus Tangens function, you get like a signed uh, directional value. You can see here it goes from minus uh, pi to pi. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's some sort of orientation that you're actually calculating. So if you now uh, filter this, uh, like iteration five, that's the row below, then you can see you get uh, these structures, these blob structures, uh, just bandpass filtered white noise. And then the face image turns out to be something which uh, looks very similar to what you have here on the right, which is uh, uh, the picture actually taken from the cat. So um, that was uh, a very nice kind of uh, demonstration where people said it's like, okay, so uh, can't you just use white noise to generate these maps instead of actually killing all these nice cats? Um, and uh, people have been very careful afterwards to actually um, uh, make sure that the data they get on the right from the, from the real cats uh, are not just uh, filtered white noise. So this kind of thing, um, that was something that I did at my masters, you know, doing this kind of uh, data processing, calculating these maps. There are some features in here, like these pinwheels, singularities where all the different orientations are very close to each other. Those ones are actually, um, uh, um, you know, a, a model for them is like uh, hyper columns. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you can go from there uh, and you can do a lot of uh, uh, neuroanatomy and compare the spatial frequency with orientation frequency uh, preference on, on the uh, cortex if, if you want to. So um, just to, to go to now, you know, forget this, uh, 10 years pass, uh, now you, you sit in Bergen and you have this uh, workflow integrated deep learning model. And uh, what we're doing there is we're basically trying to, you know, use medical data in order to um, detect COVID or uh, lung tumors or, you know, any kind of classification or segmentation uh, or regression uh, problem. And we're trying to use, you know, the, the best possible models for doing this. So one of the approaches we had was uh, doing this with deep learning. And then if you just look up one of the most prominent deep learning models, you, know, as you can see there on the left, you know, you just type in ResNet 18. Um, 
you will see that um, the number of parameters for this model is, is like 11 million. And there, there are more ResNet models, you know, ResNet 34 and ResNet 50 and ResNet 150. Um, they're basically bigger and bigger versions of the same basic architecture that has been one of the most successful ones used for medical imaging. So um, one rule of thumb is that uh, training data should equal kind of, you know, 10 times the number of parameters, <laughs> uh, which is, um, you know, if you ask statistics, they, they say it's like, um, you know, it should be more like 30 uh, data points to, to estimate one uh, data, um, one parameter of the model. So in this case, uh, it, it is clear that 11 million uh, for the smallest ResNet model, you know, it, you have like 23 million for ResNet 50, for example, is, uh, is, is a little bit of a problem because uh, that means you have to use a, a, lot of, a lot of training data. So to make training um, work for these large networks, there's a lot of tricks. And first of all is, of course, that people use a very large tra uh, training data set. Um, and then there are um, you know, all of these approaches to make training a little bit easier. In the medical domain, this basically translates to, so if I want to solve a particular problem and I want to use uh, an architecture like ResNet 18, then is this even theoretically possible to do? Um, Am I not, uh, you know, misusing the technology by, you know, just using the data of a study, which is maybe, you know, 200 patients instead of what I should use, which is maybe, you know, uh, 22 million patients to, to train such a model. And um, in, in this real world problem, there is, I'm not going to talk about all the possible solutions and why this actually is, is working in most cases. But it's basically I'm using this as an argument to to you know make my case that maybe it's 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 worthwhile to look for other sources of training data, and there are more reasons to do this. Uh, one of course is uh, you know you want to control a little bit that the um, that the images that you use for training are appropriate for the use of the model, which is in our case in in the medical field. So how, how do people train ResNet 18? Uh, so they, they go to ImageNet, um, just it's a screenshot from the webpage. So ImageNet is, is, has a, like an ontology driven structure. So they, you can see there on the left, this is uh, ImageNet 2011. And they, they, they order uh, fields, there, there is, for example, animals, and in animals, there are domestic animals, and inside domestic animals, you see domestic cat. And for domestic cats, there are a lot of different uh, categories for them, and you can see if you select them here on the right, example images. What they basically do is, for each of the categories in this ontology, there are about maybe 300 to 500 images. So in order to learn the category domestic cat, you have access to you know, 500, 600 images. Uh, and um, if you're using this as a training data set, then um, you end up with like 14 million images that you can use to train uh, ResNet 18 with you know, 11 million parameters. And that kind of works and it produces a useful, uh, a useful model. Okay, so today's problem, of course, we have um, we, we we don't have cats. Um, we like them, uh, you know, uh, to uh, to to keep them at home, but uh, not for experiments. So we we actually have uh, you know lung tissue uh, CT images, and the 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 thing is, if we train a network like ResNet with ImageNet, uh, how appropriate are those really? If we apply them afterwards to um, to medical images, and uh, the the key here, of course, is that the technique that is used currently is is pre-training. So you're you're using the ResNet 18 as it is trained with ImageNet, and then you're just uh, removing the last layer and retrain it with your new uh, data set which comes from the imaging domain. So most of the parameters are trained with kind of cats and dogs and only the last layer is then trained based on your medical images. 
and the, the that that reduces the number of training data for such a model to you know a couple of hundred or thousands, uh, and that means that it makes it possible to apply those models to uh, medical problems. Um, of course, you you have some downsides, and there's like some of them are listed down here. So the training data, you know, it's cats and dogs, and they're like uh, from all different views. It's basically a data set that is used to recognize objects in in a three D environment. And, and that means all the data is RGB. So we have three channels. Most data in the medical field is just grayscale. Um, <clears throat> images have like an, an image net and for these training data sets there, they all have a fixed resolution. Uh, mostly it's, it's crappy. It's uh, these 224 by 224. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it, it's not all of them. It, and it's not all of them that bad resolution, but most of them that are used for like a pre-trained model are somewhere in this in this uh, area. So for medical images, we basically start usually with 256 by 256. Um, we would like to uh, do this with 512 by 512. Um, and the you know lung images, uh, those are 1024 by 1024. No, we like powers of two. So we are a little bit over what the network is actually trained for. So if you apply something like this, you have to, you know, like downscale your images uh, to make them 224 by 224 in order to apply them to such a model. Again, I'm making this very, very easy. And a lot of people will be, you know, it's like, no, that's not true. There is a lot of different solutions. I'm, I'm trying to be very pessimistic here just uh, as an argument to generate more appropriate data. Just to, to do this. Okay, so now your so real fake data. I mean, that's a very old technology. Here's like a, um, um, just a, a paper that, uh, you know, for seed um, uh, segmentation, they're trying to use machine learning to detect objects in uh, on these pictures. You see on the left there, real world images, um, those seeds against some, uh, non-uniform backgrounds. And what they would like to do is just count them and have a neural network do this task. Uh, it's, a, it's something that is, you know, you can do with, um, with standard techniques as well, you know, morphological operators and, you know, uh, taking care of non-uniform illumination, etc. But uh, in this case, they basically just showed how you can use a deep learning network and you can train it with um, synthetic data sets. And the synthetic data sets are very easy. They have uh, just background images, like a pool of background images. And then they have a, a pool of images that show seeds, real seeds in different orientations. And then they synthesize the data. They just put all the seeds on top of each other in the image digitally. And then they, of course, know for every single seed where it is, how big it is, uh, if there's any overlap, et cetera. It, it, it is basically a synthesized data set with the perfect truth. So if you use this for training, you don't have to annotate the data uh, in order to uh, train, but you generated the data. And that means that you, you have the perfect, uh, you, you know what the perfect world looks like. So this has been very successful. And uh, we, we're trying to do something similar now. So I, I start with, um, with this basic idea and now, now come the crappy images, so, so sorry. <laughs> so I start with this basic idea of uh, using bandpass filtered uh, white noise. And it's easy you know, to generate it in 2D and in 3D. So everything I'm talking about now is actually in 3D. So it's, it's very simple um, volumes of like 64 by 64 by 64 or any other resolution that, that we would like to have in those. So just as an illustration, uh, if you bandpass filter them, you end up with uh, data around uh, zero and some of them will be positive, some of them will be negative. And you can map this to um, like darker or brighter colors. And if you have uh, an object like this, then of course you can just uh, calculate an isosurface. And using that isosurface as a visualization of the areas that are below or, or uh, uh, above threshold. Okay, so we, we can do this now two times. You, you, you have one um, image one. <laughs> 
and we bandpass filter it to get the structure. And then we have an image to bandpass filter and get a structure. For each of them, we can calculate the isosurface. And that means we have now from random, given the parameters of the, of the smoothing um, isosurfaces at a given resolution. And we have two of them that we can actually put in the same space. They're on top of each other. And therefore, we can calculate intersections. And you know, if you have uh, like a manifold in 3D space and you intersect it with another one, those uh, will result in, um, in intersection lines. <laughs> so if in, in 2D, of course, it's a point, but in 3D, uh, all of these uh, structures intersect and then they form line segments. So this, this is basically the starting point where I thought where I thought is like, oh, this is this is cool. So from from noise, uh, I can now generate lines in space. And lines in space are useful for for a number of things. So here's an example. Um, you know, if you just code this uh, to just to visualize what is actually happening. So I'm I'm using uh, the normal margin cubes to calculate the isosurfaces. And um, I'm actually, uh, it's, I'm running it twice. So once for visualization, it's using uh, uh, triangulated meshes, but the, the, the green and the blue one. But in order to show the um, intersection between the two, I'm actually just using uh, a very simple threshold rule. So it's a, it's a rule that is done on the discrete data grid on the 64 by 64 by 64 grid. So for every voxel, I just basically check, is the value sufficiently close to the threshold? And in this case, the threshold is zero. So is it sufficiently close to zero? And is it sufficiently close to zero in both image one and in image two? And you can see here like an um, isosurface uh, uh, representation of the voxels that uh, fulfill this kind of threshold. So that, that are at the intersection. And I thought, you know, if you look at this, they, you know, they follow these ridges and they, they're like uh, oriented in all kinds of ways. Um, and because uh, this is done on a discrete grid, this actually makes it look very, very similar to what you would um, see under, you know, low uh, magnification in some side of uh, some sort of microscope, for example. You know, uh, I, I colored them red. Uh, for a reason, <laughs> you know, um, lines in space that are colored red. Hopefully, you can see that those are, you know, uh, blood vessels, of course. So, this is like uh, just uh, there are no blood vessels here. This is not real data, this is just fake data. Um, okay. So, if you now, you know, it's like it go away from the uh, surface rendering approach uh, that was just done here to illustrate the principle. And you, you basically do this now on, on a high resolution volume. Then the operation is very easy because it's really just um, uh, you know, a filtering step um, plus um, a, a local operation at each voxel um, to get a binary mask. I'm here, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, filtering the binary mask once more, just with a with a simple point spread function to simulate uh, um, not like a sharp mask, but uh, something that you that would basically be um, on on some level realistic enough for something that you would measure with uh, with an actual um, um, machine, you know, with either a microscope or a scanner or some reconstruction step. So it's basically adding the physical effect of measuring to the truth data. And the truth data is really just binary. It's, it, in this case, it's either part of these line structures or not being part of the line structures. And uh, because it's such a cheap way of doing this, you can see here that it's incredibly easy to generate um, very, very complex looking structures. And the only parameters here are, of course, the random fields at the beginning plus the specific type of uh, spatial filtering that is done on each of them. Uh, and and those, those two steps uh, basically are sufficient to, um, to generate uh, uh, cubes um, basically arbitrarily big. So you, you see the cutout there. Um, th there's you know, high and 
less dense areas. There is uh, line segments that curve around with different uh, curvature. Um, uh, so I, I, I was really happy with that approach. And then I thought we can do a little bit more. So, so I went back and if you think about the isosurfaces and how they intersect, then the, uh, this using like an isosurface, you can change the threshold. So if you, if from, from, you know, if you have these two images and you, you, you isosurface them, so but if you change the threshold, then you're guaranteed with the isosurface to go into, into the normal plane. So you're, you're basically, uh, you have isosurface at some point and then you are changing the threshold and that gives you an offset uh, uh, surface. And you can you know, do many of those if you, if you change either the first threshold or the second threshold. I'm, I'm right now changing both of them at the same time. So just by a given, by a given distance d. So the intensity in the image uh, that I use as a threshold is not zero anymore, but there is some offset value. If you do this, then you can now change the intersection points in a very predictable way. It, it's basically for each of the intersecting uh, lines that we have, we are moving in a plane of the, the defined by the normal and binormal of, the, of, of each of the vertices. And, and that basically means we have now an orientation system on the curved lines that allows us to move them around. And we can move them around so that the distance of, the, of, of all the line <laughs> that we generate with different uh, thresholds is, uh, is, is guaranteed to be a specific uh, uh, um, size of a specific uh, size D. So you, you can see this down there, you know, if I, if I shift uh, uh, one isosurface, I can, I can move in one direction. And if I shift the, the other isosurface, I can move in a, in, a, in a different direction. And that means I have, you know, um, um, uh, a frame around each point and I can move lines around. Um, so I, I'm not ending up with a single line, but I can generate pairs of lines or triplets of lines or grids of lines. Um, how, how this looks like uh, is, is, is like this. So, so this one is nice again because uh, it's actually, <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> the lines are um, sufficiently far apart. The D is a little bit bigger and uh, I'm uh, doing the point spread function on them. I'm calculating an isosurface, importing it into Blender and then just rendering it. That's why they look kind of nice, but it's the same, it's the same raw data. There are three different line segments. So I have used uh, um, like a distance uh, away from the point uh, in the positive and in the negative direction. And uh, it, it's the red, the blue, and this uh, brownish uh, kind of um, uh, vessel type structure. And <clears throat> for the, uh, because of the way they're generated, they're guaranteed never to overlap. Uh, because you know, it's like that's it comes from the geometric approach of of using these isosurfaces. So this is kind of cool because you can you can even do um, you know you you have a frame now and you can move in that frame. Um, here, here is basically what the raw data looks like, just moving through one volume slice by slice uh, with three different uh, uh, offset uh, objects in you know gray and magenta and this kind of turquoise uh, color. So you, you, you end up with uh, volumetric uh, structures where lines have a given thickness and lines have a given distance away from each other. And you can, you can basically fill space with those in a predictable way. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I, I was happy because now I had like um, more than one line you know, two lines is already an artery and a vein, uh, and they're given distance away from each other, and they're uh, equally covering, you know, 1D structures covering 3D space. It's, that's, uh, that, that would be nice if one can show this. Um, there's actually a little bit more that the structured approach gives us. Um, um, what we have as well is, uh, if we go away from the isosurfaces, just go back to the blob structures then our intersecting isosurfaces, they're also 
um, providing you know, a binary pair of values for each voxel because we have image one and we have image two. And uh, in some areas they're above threshold and in some areas they're below threshold. So every voxel actually has an index that tells me uh, it's above threshold in image one and below threshold in image two. Or it could be above threshold in both of them and below thresholds uh, in both of them, etc. So there are four different combinations. So I can actually now with the thresholds, I can also color the blobs in between the lines. So I can basically um, separate out space. Uh, of course, with uh, four different regions uh, that are guaranteed not to overlap in 3D space, it's not really you know, the four color theorem for, for 2D structures. But I, I think uh, it, it would be fun to actually look a little bit more into the spatial structures that one can generate with this approach. Just to show you what this looks like. Here is uh, a volume rendering. So I'm taking these uh, cubes and I'm basically just uh, volume rendered the, the image one in grayscale. And then I'm volume rendering image two in this uh, red green color map. I'm using a kind of a color map that has transparency in it. So I'm only showing half of the volumes, the, the positive uh, um, volume. So you can see a little bit the in intermediate space. And they're basically sitting, you know, they're totally independent. <laughs> they're sitting on top of each other. Um, and they're generating uh, structured 3D data at a given resolution. You see the, the red intersecting, you know, voxel grid here again. So if we, if we put both together, then we end up now with, um, you know, a data cube where each voxel has a ground truth value. In this case, we are back to three uh, plus four different types of colored uh, intermediate regions. Based on the threshold values, you, you can uh, specify the thickness of the vessels. You can specify the distance of the vessels from each other. You can also specify the distance of the vessels from, the, from these blob structures that in the intermediate space. So it's, um, so all of this now is uh, a very low dimensional space, of course, because we, we basically um, have random fields. Uh, they're generated using um, a random number generator, you know, S seed um, in, in C. Uh, that's an unsigned int. So you end up with uh, a, a specific number of seed point, uh, seed values for the random number generator that you can have. Each one will generate a different random field. And with the same number of smoothing steps, you will generate a different version of this cube. And that basically means that we have um, a nearly infinite number of uh, uh, data sets that we can generate <laughs> on the fly using this kind of uh, structured approach. Okay, summary. Um, I, th I think uh, white noise is a great source to generate structure. Uh, this is a trivial filtering approach. Of course, you can you can think about uh, more complex ones, you know, some anisotropic filtering uh, to to generate uh, structures of a uh, specific shape. Um, one of the downsides right now is uh, that the um, the filtering approach I'm using um, is uh, basically just a, 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 you know a, a low pass filter, and that means that the structure I end up with um, doesn't have a very complex uh, frequency space um, uh, structure. That means there's basically structures on one scale in there. And of course, if you think about more complex um, structures, then you could want to have you know, large scale and small scale structure in the same model. And that would be possible if we just filter them in different ways. So you could have one level that is, um, you know, you can label it organs, and then a second level that uh, separates organs into the intermediate space structures like cells. And you can do this on any level because it's uh, driven by, um, you know, noise patterns. It's it's actually um, uh, very memory. Uh, um, um, it's it's okay to 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 use it in that way. So the design is pretty um, straightforward because there is only you know a couple of things. You have um, uh, random fields that you can put on top of each other. 
uh, that depend that generates then the the type of structure you want, and you would be able to um, probably apply it to some other fields as well. Hopefully, I'm I'm looking forward to to input from that. There is a lot of different questions I just have to ask uh, myself, <laughs> and uh, I, I see the uh, hands raising already. So I, I, maybe we can we can start with uh, with some questions from the audience. You okay? Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, description. And I will have some questions as well, but uh, let's start it off with uh, the proper questions. So Stefan, please, if you could turn on your mic and camera and ask your questions, go ahead. So I, I will not turn on my, my camera because I mean, I was very inspired uh, um, by, uh, uh, you know, trying out things and my cats did not like this very much. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty scratched right now. Um, that being said, uh, I, mean, I think this is a, a, a really cool approach and then I was actually eager to, to, to see how this looks. Um, we chatted about this uh, uh, a while back, um, but I have a, a maybe a, a more fundamental uh, um, question which I've always struggled with uh, um, and maybe I have some fundamental uh, um, I'm missing, I have the feeling some fundamental uh, uh, step and maybe you can provide some insight in me. So when I'm, when I have, and what you have is basically a, a, a simple model based on white noise, based on con convolution uh, um, to, to generate data. Now, when I'm training uh, 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 an algorithm with that data, why would there be the expectation that I learn anything else but this model. Meaning I'm only learning the degrees of freedom of that model. And then, well, why don't I skip that step and directly use the model for whatever classification task I, I have? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So the, the answer I would give you for that is that it is, much easier to um, to use this model in the generating direction than it is in the um, uh, in the opposite direction. So if you if you want to you know you start from noise and you will get a structure out, but I cannot uh, put a vessel somewhere and then ask so what noise pattern generated will will generate that that vessel in the forward step. So this, this is a little bit what you would uh, maybe uh, hope to do when you, when you use the model for real data. You know, so where is the vessel? You would have to ask, so what, what is the random field that generates the, the structure? Because then you have the for, uh, go, playing this back in the opposite direction, you would be able to label. So it's, I, I don't know how to, how to do this uh, because the, the random fields are by definition um, they don't have a, a very good structure. So I, I, I don't have a gradient to go into some specific direction. I, uh, Stefan, is this, uh, is this an answer or did I uh, miss? Not miss quite. So, so I mean, I, 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 can see, I can see the argument that, um, well, you, you may not, you may be able to, to generate those things, but you may not be able to sort of invert uh, uh, whatever you want. So I can, I can see that. Still, though, in terms of, uh, and I don't see where the information would come from on a, on a fundamental level that would then um, enable a classifier uh, uh, um, to distinguish between, well, like a, a, a false positive in the case of the fabricated data or actual real data. So. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see where this comes in, except if you add basically a step where you have a human that goes and basically, for example, sorts through uh, 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 thousands of uh, however many of uh, generated data sets and says, okay, this one looks realistic, this one doesn't. That, then I can see. So then yeah. you have this additional information. If you don't do that, I don't see where, where this can, can ever come from. So the the thing, my answer to this would be that um, you know this uh, kind of uh, Spatz in the hand is besser als 
ein äh, Taube in der Luft. Uh, yes, it's, 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 um, if you train your model using, um, using data that is um, available uh, you know, in, in, in an infinite am amount with uh, a given ground truth that uh, you know, be because we know exactly for each voxel what the true value is, which of the blood vessels it is, which of the ROIs it is, is it a blood vessel, is it an ROI? If you're able to generate data like this, then you will know at the end that your model has learned exactly that. If you, on the other hand, uh, have a human in the loop, then you will lose control of what the human considers to be um, accurate mm -hmm. or not. So it might be, I, I think it, the one argument would be, you know, I would prefer a model that I can interpret and that will be wrong sometimes from a model that uh, is uh, tailor-made and that I cannot uh, uh, inspect in this way because I, I, you know, I do not co fully control the data that it has been trained with. Um, the, the thing I, I'm listing here, the, you know, in this uh, remaining question, <laughs> this uh, uh, structure, you know, the, the data that we have here, they look complex, but they're not because uh, in terms of Komorov complexity, you know, just like counting the, the bits that generate the program, uh, the, <clears throat> the program is available on, um, on, on this GitHub. Uh, um, uh, link you you can see the source code. You know, of course, they are not uh, they are not complex in this uh, sense of the of of the of the world, but they are understandable, and uh, that might be something worthwhile. You know, being able to understand. If you um, if you look and on on this example, like the slide that I used for you know, it's like looking at the binary labels for the blood vessels you can actually see some features that you would discover in the real uh, world scenario as well. The, uh, because of, you know, is a voxel in the intersection or not given some threshold, that's a sampling step. And that will produce, given the, um, you know, the angle of the vessel, artifacts where, you know, there will be space, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it, 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 it's not, it, it, this is a binary assignment <laughs> and therefore you will end up with gaps in those lines. So if you make them thin enough and if they're uh, angled in a specific way, then you will see points and then nothing and then another point and then nothing and then another point. This is data that simulates, um, you know, at just the limits in the image generation and a neural network that would uh, try to learn, you know, this type of pattern, they would have to integrate this information of the directions in space, which is uh, something useful. You know, it's that that's a task if the network would be able to do it to identify there is a gap, but they're actually belonging to the same vessel structure. That would be something that is baked into the way that the uh, data is generated, and it could be useful for real world cases because that, that's a difficult case where you had to uh, uh, generate examples of uh, truth and measure measurement. And uh, you, you want to, uh, in this deep uh, neural network structures, you, you basically need those pairs of, of values. I, um, ne next I, question. I could also, I could yep. also see that, 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 this, this, that, that your approach could be um, adjusted to we see that from actual data in a probabilistic manner to get this information in there. I I didn't catch that. That, that you that you're actually seeding your process using uh, actual data, right? In some mm -hmm. probabilistic yep. way. Yes. I, th yeah, I think the, that that would, would would definitely be be yes. mis be a way to incorporate additional information in there. Yeah. there. There is, for example, you know, um, the hyperparameter of this model, like the thickness and the density. Uh, uh, th those could all be learned from actual example data in in very simple ways, and then you could generate appropriate uh, data for some domain. Yes. Thanks. No, cool stuff. The the, 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 the the GitHub is, is public. Of course. Yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely want to play around with this a bit. 
Yeah, so I on on the GitHub, I, I have this um, uh, explain uh, uh, folder as well. Yeah, I, I hope you can see the uh, location of the GitHub repository mm -hmm. here on your screen. And in the explain, there is some toy examples in JavaScript code that uh, show the basic process. Um, you, you can run them locally. But the um, in, inside the inside the lung segmentation projects, in this case, there is the fake data uh, module, which is just doing this uh, in, in a simple ITK um, uh, module. So if, if somebody wants to start with something, but, but it's really so trivial uh, that you probably can build this in any uh, system that you're familiar with, like, a, you know, MATLAB or something else. There were some other questions? Yes, I think Halvik had another question. If there are more questions, please write, raise the hands or indicate in the chat or however you like. Uh, Halvik, go ahead. Thank you, Hauke. I mean, um, this was highly interesting and very topical, I guess. And I would expect that we will see more work, not only of you, but of, of many in this direction, because the, the lack of good training data is, is really uh, um, haunting uh, all these expectations of, of deep learning in, in uh, serious applications. So thanks for this contribution. I think this was very stimulating. My, my questions are maybe somewhat aligned to what Stefan said, uh, but maybe a little more uh, specific to some example, uh, to some details. So, so one is, uh, I mean, you, you motivated um, your, your talk a little bit with this seed example, which is very nice. And um, it seems very obvious that uh, these artificially generated uh, fake pictures of seeds can be can be used for training such a counting uh, network. Um, I guess, however, that we, we need to assume that the, the further you uh, de uh, deviate from a real world picture, the more you run into a risk that your network does not pick up the actually wanted information, but something else and produces good results for your fake pictures, but then doesn't work for the, for the real pictures. I guess if we now look at, at, at your examples, it's wonderful to see how you can uh, bootstrap in, in short time some, some, some nice uh, working examples. But obviously, one would probably wish more. I don't know. I mean, I see loops in your vessels that I do not expect in, in, in real pictures. Um, I see many other types of, of features like you know disconnected uh, pieces and whatnot. So I mean, I guess everyone spots immediately uh, the potential for improvement. I was wondering, say, on the one hand, one could ask, haven't people formulated, say, statistical models for structures of interest? I, I would not be surprised if, if you could find in the literature, say, statistical uh, models for the distribution of vessels uh, in or at least on a small scale uh, or something like that. And then um, I guess this could be could be uh, easily used to to make a big leap towards more realistic images. But most most interesting. The, yeah. Yeah. Havik, the, it, that's a that's a very good point. And, you know, I I try to say this is not, uh, you know, this, yeah, I, I didn't find the, you know, the, the, the really, a really new thing here. There, there are many ways to generate uh, more appropriate data for a given task. There is, um, there is this weird uh, finding for these, uh, you know, these, the, the, these magical properties that these deep learning models have. <laughs> um, you you remember that they all um, you know they have so many parameters, but uh, using the you know dropping uh, connections and augmentation and so on, they're they're trying to get the essence of of some structures. So what happens actually is that um, the the more designed your example is, the more control you put into the the training data. So you you know what you provided the network as a source of information and that's that's a good thing but it also means that you have to 
you know, it's, it's a gradual process and you have to, um, you know, assume that you have understood the data correctly. You know, that, that's, uh, that uh, some features are really the important ones. And that kind of understanding is, um, is, is, uh, is required to generate very detailed models that, um, that, has, that, that have the features of real blood vessels in some organ, for example. And that might be uh, a, a completely different model in some other uh, organ of interest, uh, it, it, even though there are still blood vessels. So it, I'm, I'm not, so I'm, I'm basically saying that there is a, a continuum so there might be um, cases where um, the vessels generated by this are not appropriate. You know, uh, one example here is uh, they're, they're basically tend to be equal diameter. So you don't have a really uh, a, a tree that um, uh, where, where there is one root and then it branches into different points. This is, this is like more what you will see in microvasculature. In, instead of a large blood vessel. So it's not, it's not a model to generate blood vessels. It is a model to generate easily data where we can simulate some of the artifacts of imaging. Like uh, um, you know, if, if it's filled with some contrast that uh, there is no contrast everywhere or that there is partial volume effects uh, and, and the, I think you should only use this as a means to teach a network to do something like that. So what happens if you're training it on these loops? You can see my, my mouse cursor, hopefully. It's, it's uh, on top of one of these loops. Uh, of, of course, they, they are generated if you think about the 3D space of these non, you know, of, of, of these uh, independent isosurfaces. Um, they're totally um, artificial in the sense. And they would never happen in, uh, in, in, or yeah, I, I, I don't say never because you can look in reality and you will find everything, <laughs> even, even loops in blood vessels, uh, simply because of the artifacts that you get through the imaging technique. So I, th I think the, the controlled way in which you generate a large amount of data is on, on one extreme end, and then measuring uh, real blood vessels uh, is on, on, a, on a completely opposite end, uh, where you need a lot of more information about the, uh, the blood vessel structure. So it's probably not a good model if you want to distinguish blood vessel structures inside the tumor from blood vessel structures outside. If I may, I just have one more question in that direction. So, so you know, I think we, at least the older among us, uh, still have this, this um, respect for the possible situation that a black box uh, deep learning model functions, but not because of the reasons you want it to, to work. It, because it, it, it learned a different aspect that, that you didn't want it to learn, but it still gives you, uh, say, good results for the test data you, you, you give it, right? I don't know. Uh, I'm thinking back to the old days where the, the, the tank classification uh, learned the blue sky instead of the tank. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's more complicated now than it was back then. But still, I think the, the, the principal situation is still there. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, it's, it's even more important to, to see what can we do in order to either check that, that the network actually learned what we wanted or be influenced that it, it does so. And I'm, I'm curious to, to hear more about work that has been done in that direction, because the situation is even more difficult now, right? I mean, here you, are, you want to achieve an effect based on some data that is different from what you eventually will supply. Yeah. In, in, in many different ways different. Yes. So one, it's the, the example with the tank is, is really great. There have been so many more examples more recently about uh, you know there, there's this one that the the deep neural network uh, classifying trains uh, using and then just detecting the tracks you know if there's a track on the picture that means there must be a train so accidental features that are given the training data set there they happen in these uh, um, uh, you know, these models, these more recent models, of, of course. And I would argue that this is, is very relevant uh, for a ResNet model as well, because we're, we're training it to detect a cat, but this is a classification task, you know, somewhere on this picture is a cat. 
and maybe all cat people have you know fluffy pillows and what the network detects is something easier like uh, there is a fluffy pillow on the picture and then it knows oh then there must be a cat and that that comes from training data that is not controlled or that has a less degree of of control in it so you you end up with accidental features in this case i would argue that it's not the case um, there there are no fluffy pillows in these blood vessel pictures and and i would hope that there are one additional way to make sure that something like this does not happen that accidental features are not le learned if we if we you know it's like uh, of course we would want to apply the same features you know we would want to inspect the models afterwards uh, which features in, in the image they actually used to to make a classification task or, or not but at least we have uh, ground truth and therefore we we know um, that uh, we can test it sufficiently and i think the the, the training is one thing but uh, we also have an infinite amount of test data that the, that the network will never have seen before. You know, give, given unsigned ins data range is, is uh, to test that the network generalizes is easy in this case. Um, if it's appropriate for real world data, that's a, that's, a more, that's a more difficult problem. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, thanks for the questions, very, very good. Sorry for talking too long on each one. No, thank you, Hauke, for such an amazing talk, and thank you so much for all the explanation with the questions. Thank the audience for uh, joining us today, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again uh, next month um, with the next VCF. The announcement will come soon, hopefully, uh, as it usually does. And um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a great 2021. See you. Thank you.